The funny thing is, like, you would not get in nearly as much trouble as, you know, the one time you gave the talk at the, what's it called? The, the League of the South or whatever. Oh, the, like, yeah, yeah, I know. You appeared with a... Funny, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Th- that League of the South thing, mm-hmm. Eric Foner was obsessed with it. Oh, was he? Back when it was... Oh, he, 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 he was getting the newsletter. He would have it on his desk. He was very concerned, but he even wrote a little bit about it. Oh, but at God. that time, it was oh, obviously God. all you had to do is look at the names who were there. It was all a bunch of nerdy PhDs. That's mm-hmm. all it was. Right. I mean, Clyde Wilson's a nerdy PhD. Thomas right. Fleming got his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill in classics. You know, right. not exactly gonna you know overthrow the U.S. government, right? right? <laughs> the, the whole list of them was all. Um, uh, Don Livingston. Uh-huh. Was a Hume scholar at Emory. I mean, you know, these are all, we're all harmless little nerds who <laughs> thought we were going to accomplish something, right? So, yeah, he was obsessed with it. But, oh, man. but then, you know, then of course, in the you know when the 21st century came along, unfortunately, it took some crazy turn. And then I, thought, ah, you know, son of a, you know. So then now I'm now associated with every crazy bullshit thing they do and say. And huh. but I'm not. I'm just never ever going to be the kind of person who apologizes for something they didn't do wrong. I, I didn't do anything wrong. I was interested in the South. I thought, um, I thought Eugene Genovese was right that, yeah. that there is some value in Southern civilization. It's not just slavery yeah. and that it's ridiculous the way Southerners are treated. And I said this as a lifelong Northerner. I have no particular dog in this hunt. Right. And then it meant that I was, I was getting smeared and attacked and abused. And I just thought, you know, I could get these people off my backs by saying, oh, I am so sorry I did something that you didn't approve of, but I couldn't live with myself. You know, fuck these people. Yeah. Good for you for cursing too, Tom. I've never heard you curse. Yeah, sorry. I, it's, it's, the, fantastic. it's the fattiest Russell. It's about time. <laughs> I've listened to hundreds of your shows. Never once have I heard you curse. <laughs> well, I think there's one or two where I cursed and then we bleeped me out. We, I bleeped <laughs> myself out on my own show just to be funny. Don't do that. Let yourself be free, Tom. So well, the, I do, the, I'll tell you, the main reason I do it is, is not so much that, you know, well, that's just Woods' personality. I mean, to some degree it is, but it's, mo- it's, it's mainly that I want to be the podcast that mom and dad can yeah. listen to and not yeah. worry about in the car. Right. Yeah, this is my problem. My, my audience is limited for a bunch of reasons, and that's one of them. So I'm, I'm struck by, I guess I didn't realize that your whole political transformation really occurred while you were at Columbia. Like you went, yes, you, you which did is the whole why thing. you and I wouldn't have gotten along in the beginning. Oh you no! Know, at the end, I would have gotten along with you. Oh yeah, but, no, no. But I, I, no. I am. Um, I mean, I'm quite sure I w- assumed you were had a characterological flaw or evil in some way. I mean, at first, <laughs> I didn't put a whole lot of thought to you. We were more concerned with Vin Canato. Did you? Were, you must have been friends with him. Who was that? Oh, do you know Vincent Canato? Vin Canato? No. How do I not know these names? He was the other Republican there. I never met him. Yeah. I was looking. <laughs> yeah. Well, he came, I think, after you. And he, yeah, he was, but he hung out with us. He played poker with us. But he was a, he was a Republican who actually worked for the party. He campaigned for, wow. I forget which candidate was his. And he's now got a job at UMass Amherst teaching. He's been a professor. He's, and he wrote a good book, I think, on Lindsay and New York City. But um, anyway, so that's, oh, okay. but you did all that by yourself, like locked away in your little apartment that we all lived in. You you went through that whole well, transition, especially when there. Yeah, there's very little internet in those days. I mean, it existed, right. but That's it right. wasn't the encyclopedic. That's every right. Answer was available, so yeah, it was a matter of I had to think and and <laughs> and and be able to say I'm wrong about this or I'm wrong about that, uh, yeah. which is which is by the way a hard thing to do when you you know you're Ivy League educated, so you have this the same kind of Ivy League hubris every kid has that I know it all. Right. Mm-hmm. I went to these schools. I know it all. And mm-hmm. then to say, maybe I'm looking at the world all wrong is a hard thing to do. And, and, and then now today, of course, as I say, I get abused and oh my gosh, look at the things that he was doing in the 1990s. But okay. But it was hard to, for me to say, okay, I'm, I'm on the wrong track. I need to do something different. I mean, I give myself credit for that. Yeah. I wonder if Mises is even in the Butler Library at Columbia. Like, how would you even? <laughs> I'm oh, sure. he's got to be. I'm sure he is, but I mean, no I one mean, ever. If, no one ever checks yeah, it oh, out. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. So we know for a fact he's in the library. It's just no right. one's reading him. I mean, look, if my books are in Columbia's library, I know, I know his are. I'm not sure mine is. I haven't checked. I wonder. I'm not even sure. The, uh, I had not heard of Ludwig von Mises until many years after I got my PhD, Tom many years i'd never heard the name 
I, I taught Hayek in the contemporary civilization, the great books course at Columbia. And that's the only reason I knew anything about Hayek, but these guys were simply not discussed. So, you know, I, I did four and a half years undergraduate. I did eight years as a graduate student at an elite school in the social sciences, basically. Isn't this remarkable? And the only yeah. economist and the only economist, Tom Woods, I ever read during those years, those 12 plus years, 13 years, was Karl Marx. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, and no one ever, no one ever story. said, no one ever said, oh, you know what? You should brush up on economics a bit. Oh, you should read maybe a couple of economics texts if you're going to be a PhD in social science. No one ever, it was never a problem because yeah. no one else was either. No one else knew any economics. We never talked economics. We just knew, no, that's right. we just knew what good economics was and bad economics was, meaning moral economics and immoral economics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and, and that, amazing. as I'm sure you know, your story could be repeated, you know, uh-huh. millions of times over by other people. I knew the name Mises, just the name, uh-huh. because starting in high school, I subscribed to National Review when Bill Buckley was still alive. I thought uh-huh. that made me cheeky. I got National Review as a high school student and into college, and they would mention the name Mises. Uh, and so I figured this must be a pretty good guy, but that was as far as it went. It, what, one time I was, I was auditing Alan Brinkley's sur- 20th century survey course. Uh-huh. I, I, it was an undergraduate course, but I thought, it, just in preparation for the oral exams, it couldn't hurt to brush up, especially with the guy who's going to be examining me. You know, yeah. it c- couldn't hurt to sit in <laughs> on this class. So I would audit that class. And of course, I kept my mouth shut back there. And it wasn't, it was a lecture course anyway, you don't typically participate. But every once in a while, a hand would go up and he would call on somebody. And it was a, it was a day he was talking about the Great Depression, and he was putting forward the different theories as to why the Great Depression occurred. So, you know, he's got the, the underconsumption theory and all this. And then he says, now there's a right wing theory that taxes mm. and tariffs cause the problem, but we all know that can't be right because of, and, and that was the entirety of the, of the uh, other way of, so it was going to be, we have these sophisticated models, and then we have this dumb guy Jude Winiski model. Right. So I couldn't, I just couldn't, couldn't sit there. So I it? raised my hand. And I took a minute and a half to explain, and I just used the name Hayek so as not to alarm Brinkley, as I knew he, mm-hmm. he respected Hayek. And I said, Hayek's theory, which actually won him the Nobel Prize, was the following. <laughs> and, you know, I, that, that probably also deserves mention. And he was respectful, and, and he mentioned the importance of Hayek, and then he continued. And I thought, okay, I've done my job. I just wow. needed them to know that there was more to the story. What? What a citadel, what a cathedral it is, you know? Um, it's uh, the uniformity of thought. It's remarkable how well they kept, uh, kept so many contrary ideas sealed out of that place. This is Columbia University, with, which is a graduate school factor, factory with multiple graduate programs teaching all sorts of social science and humanities. And yet I never had to read economics you know, basic ideas in economics, like, you know, the, their theory, you know, uh, supply side theories or whatever, you know, right, market, free market theories about the cause of the Great Depression were kept out. I mean, really basic stuff. Eric Foner, whose parents were famous communists, and I was his TA many times, he would give lectures on the Communist Party in his American radical tradition course, which I was a TA for. And Tom, the con- I don't know if you know this, the Communist Party USA, it was just a civil rights organization and, a, and, and it helped labor unions. That's it. That's all it did, man. It's listen, that's all it did. Um, it just was really, it was really on the side of the good people and period. Like no mention, no mention that it was working with the Soviet Union. No mention. And, and, yeah. yeah, I'm sure it didn't <laughs> tow the Kremlin line on anything. Oh, no. Yeah, no, no. Well, the, United, the USSR was simply not mentioned in the narrative about the Communist Party. It was not, that was just a, an incidental thing, I suppose. Yeah. I didn't even mention it. What, what are you going to do with people like this? This is, we're in, we're in the, the top, arguably top institution, the most famous history pro- program there is. Movies have been made about it, right? The Marathon Man, you know about, you know about that? That was, that was based on Columbia history graduate students. No, I didn't. Yeah, Dustin Hoffman was one of us, and he ends up chasing Nazis, and Nazis end up torturing him. But yeah, it starts with, it actually starts with a whole bunch of grad students on the steps of Lowe, 
and they're they're talking about, hey, did you get that? Did you get that course from so and so professor? Oh wow, I didn't get it. I mean, they're doing all the same stuff that we did, but it it back in the 1960s, I guess. But it's about the Columbia History Department and U.S. history too. It's about us. That's pretty good. So it's very famous, and um, it's in New York City, the, you know, the most cosmopolitan city on earth, and yet we were treated like monks, right, to be protected from the outside world. Yeah, yeah, and and yet even the monks were, you know, apparently copying texts, some of which were secular. You know, at least sometimes they were even exposed to things other than just religious texts. And yet, I guess so. I mean, it reminds me of um, I, I've used this example before. Maybe you know an organization called Liberty Fund. They publish a lot of books in inexpensive editions, mm -hmm. uh, like you know, like the collected works of Adam Smith. Like, right. You know, some of them are more interesting than others, but they they keep these old things in print. Right, and they would they hold, and this is not generally known to the, the general public, but they hold these scholarly colloquia where where somebody proposes a topic, they come up with some readings, they put them in a binder, and fifteen scholars from around the country are sent the binder, and they're invited to come for a weekend at some fancy hotel, mm -hmm. and they're paid like a thousand dollars to be there for the weekend and just discuss the reading. It's it was one of the most, I, I, wow. I did this in the late 90s and early 2000s. It was one of the most amazing things about academia was I wow. go to a hotel I could never afford to stay in. There was a TV in my bathroom in one of these <laughs> hotels. But, but the, the, the thing about it was, at first, it was all libertarians. And we would we'd just get together. We'd get to know each other. We'd, we'd build some camaraderie. And we would have a good scholarly back and forth about these readings. Mm -hmm. When I start, as, as I started, I stopped going not because I got annoyed with them, but because after a while it wasn't worth the money to me. I'd rather be with my family for the mm -hmm. weekend. But when I was toward the end of this, I noticed that maybe half the people were now left liberals, and the idea was we're we're going to engage with them. Now, there's nothing in principle wrong with that, right? But it just occurred to me that if the, if the shoe were on the other foot, they wouldn't say you know what, let's invite some libertarians in. Let's really hash this out. They don't think of us the way we, we thought of them as people. And I don't think that's the way they look at us, really. No, no. Yeah, I know that I didn't think of you as a person. Um, and I know that we didn't think of you as a, as a right, right person. Um, and that's why no one ever reached out to you. And that's why I had no interest. I, I just sort of thought of you as like this exotic curiosity, like there was a giraffe <laughs> among us or something. You know? <laughs> Like how Maybe did he, that is the right way to think of it. How did he get? How did he get in here? <laughs> but yeah, and you know that reminds me of a yeah. point that I've been trying to emphasize lately, which is that you know today we hear people from various so-called marginalized groups talking about how difficult it is to belong to this group or that group in in modern America, or how how um, huh. how many how many ways they're oppressed on college campuses, and I, <laughs> and I think to myself. <laughs> if you could walk in my shoes, oh, man. you wouldn't make it 10 minutes with what I endured. Oh, Not man. 10 minutes. No way.